people who are buried over two meters don't survive. And this was almost twice that amount of snow. I shouldn't underestimate how close to death I think I was. Monday forecast, moderate, moderate low, minus 17. Bring the puffy. <laughs> I've always climbed for myself and because it's something that I've wanted to do. There's no logical explanation for why we do these things because it really doesn't make sense. There's something internally that just draws me to it. Michelle was always, you know, on the go, and if, if she wasn't getting after it here, she was away somewhere. She's driven, she's focused, she's always committing to climbing as a lifestyle. She was like really formative person in my mountain self. <laughs> I just wanted to live in my car and climb the longest, biggest routes I could find. Now in terms of risk, I have to take a minute. Because of where I was stake that we made on that day, sometimes I'm really scared. You shouldn't let your guard down. It was a fairly typical day, just going out with a few friends, my friend Tim and Maya. I kind of perceived the day as more of a hike. There was nothing that struck me as we shouldn't have been there. There was not a lot of skiing that was going to take place that day. It was more like glorified hiking, recon, ice lines that were in the Moraine Lake area. It was really cold when we started the day. It was minus 18. We had had some significant warming throughout the day. There's no real safe place to switch back up that slope. It's just a big alpine slope that's somewhere between 30 and 40 degrees. I was waiting for Tim to, you know, get over the call. I noticed a feeling that something was wrong. I suspected it was going to be deep, but I never suspected it was going to be like what it ended up being. And all of a sudden, I see a huge wave form, and it was exactly where I thought Michelle was. My beacon went from 654, and then it went 56. So I go back to the four, and then I take a step the other way, and it goes 56. And I was like, holy fuck, it's like a four meter burial. I felt super hopeless because everything I had read and seen told me that we weren't going to dig her out. I knew that we had to get her an airway because th there was no way we were going to get her out in a reasonable amount of time. The percentage chance of survival above two meters is like 3%. We'd had lots of deaths in the climbing community that season, and I didn't want to be the next one. I knew how much it hurt, and I didn't want to inflict that on my friends and family. When I was buried in the hole, I did see my friends who had recently died in the mountains, and one of my friends started talking to me if I would have just given up and just let go. Maybe I would have died. I spoke to a Parks Canada after. They were in the chopper, assuming that they were coming to a body recovery. Their approach was a bit unorthodox, and they were able to dig straight down once they had their probe strike. I think I was buried for 22 minutes. In hindsight, we shouldn't have been there, and we should have turned around. Normally, I, I would 
take note of like massive wind events or snow events, but I wasn't here for the whole winter, so I did not have a good understanding of the snowpack. If the whole season was a book, if you're not skiing a lot, it's kind of like just reading the last chapter of the book. You don't actually know what's been going on in the way that the different layers came to be in the snow that you're going out to ski at the end of the season when there's another meter sitting on top of that layer. We need to talk about the experiences that we've had in the mountains and we need to talk about when you make mistakes. That avalanche has changed my risk tolerance in the mountains. It could really happen to anyone. And hopefully people can learn something and prevent a future incident.